on YouTube. I have a couple of people to pray for before we get into our service this morning. I'm conducting a funeral tomorrow for John Pollock. Um, so we just want to pray for, for Sandra and for Tracy, for Mark, for Marty and for Ian and the wider family. Um, and Fox. Also for a lady I heard about yesterday um, called Mary who has pancreatic, pancreatic cancer. Um, and the doctors have said it's more days and weeks than it is months or years. But they never know what God might do. Amen. And then Jim was saying, where's Jim? Where's Jim? Where's Jim? Where's Jim? Where's Jim? Uh, not you, Jack, you're blocking. That's Jim. Jim was saying that, um, Bobby put his hand up, you're not Jim. <laughs> well, it's not well, so we want to just pray for Audra as well. Let's just, let's just bring these people before the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, this morning, before we get into your word, we want to bring people to you, Lord God, knowing that you're a God of grace and of mercy. Knowing that you hear the prayers of your saints, Lord, and, and that you do answer, Lord. You may not always answer in the way that we hope. But you will answer, Lord, according to your will. And so this morning, Father, we pray, please, for the Pollock family, Lord, that you would comfort them in their loss. At the loss of a husband and a father and a grandfather, Lord, we ask, please, in the name of Jesus, that you would remember Sandra and Tracy and Mark and Marty and, Marty and Graham, the grandchildren, John's brother, also James, Lord, that you would remember him and, and all of the family at this time. Father, as the funeral takes place tomorrow, that you would bring comfort and help and hope to the family, please, in the name of Jesus, and that through the tribute, Lord, they would recognize that in Jesus there is, as we've often said, a hope that surpasses death. And may they take hold of that hope, please. We ask you to remember, Lord, this Lady Mary, who is suffering from the cancer, Father. And although, Lord, the doctors, and they're very qualified, Lord, in, in, in what they know and what they say, but, Lord, we know you who are God, the great physician, and we would ask, Lord, that even though the doctors look at her condition and say there isn't really much hope, we turn to the God of all hope yes. and ask you, please, Father, for Mary, yes. that you would free her from this cancer in the name of Jesus Christ. There are people in this fellowship who can stand up and talk about how God has completely eradicated the cancer from their bodies or from the bodies of their loved ones. And Lord, we pray for Mary this morning in the name of Jesus Christ that you would heal her of this cancer, that you would prolong her days, O oh God, and that you, Lord, would make yourself known to her and to our wider family, please, in the name of Jesus. And we pray for James' wife, Audra, this morning, Lord, and ask, Father, that you would be near her and that you would help her to recover, Father, from the illness that she has so that, Lord, she's able to get about her business and do what needs to be done. And that, Father, she would be blessed with strength and with help, and with health, please, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, we turn to your word now this morning, and we ask that you would speak to us through it, because we believe the Bible to be the word of God. We believe that it is God-breathed. And we ask, Lord God, that the breath of God would move in this place this morning and in the lives of those who are watching in or listening in, that they, Lord God, would know your voice, that all of us would hear your voice this morning. But Lord, it's not just about hearing it, it's about the wisdom to apply what it is that we hear and to do it, Lord, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is the last talk in our What Shall You Believe series based on our Statement of Faith. And there's copies of our Statement of Faith always at the back for people to take a copy so that you know we're not a cult. This is what we believe. It's hard to believe that from the 6th of January 2019, I actually began the entire series saying these words. These days it's vital individual Christians and their church or fellowship know what they believe and in whom they have belief, because there are many ungodly, deceptive cults, and you don't have to walk too far from here, there are many ungodly, deceptive cults, sects, and religious trends, which mislead and deceive God's people away from him, and lead others into a lost eternity. This is how uh, important it is that Christians know what they believe, but more importantly, in whom they have believed. In fact, last Sunday night I spoke from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Galatians on six enemies in the church. 
Now, you could combine them all to say it's one and the same, or it's six individual enemies, but nonetheless, six enemies all working to deflect or to distract Christians or lead us astray from serving the Lord wholeheartedly. We are born again into a spiritual battle. And that battle is to get us off track, to knock us off track as far as our pursuit of God is concerned. And let me ask you this morning, in light of what I've just said, about six enemies working to deflect or distract Christians or lead us astray. Do you realize, do you realize this morning that there may be some Christians sitting here this morning in this hall? There may be some Christians who have participated in communion with us this morning. And they have praised and they have worshipped and they clapped their hands uh, in, in honouring the Lord. And yet ages ago, absolute ages ago, the enemies of God led them away from serving the Lord wholeheartedly. I wonder is that you this morning? Christian, we live in spiritually dangerous times. When Satan and his demons are fully occupied in deceiving people and leading, leading them away from the truth of God's word. This is an everyday reality for both Christian and unbeliever. You probably would have thought, well, I can understand it for the Christian, but not for the unbeliever. But it's real. The Christian needs to understand what we believe and be grounded in the truth of the Bible. And that's why we sang, He is. It's about us understanding who the Lord is. If not, then mark my words, you could be easily deceived. You could easily succumb to what the Apostle Paul calls doctrines of demons. And some of the doctrines of demons actually sound really good. We, we could embrace those doctrines of demons in a moment. A doctrine of demons said to me this morning, stay in the church of the Holy Duvet, don't bother going to shout <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't hear that. But another doctrine of a demon could say to you, oh, well, you're not ready to Stop you worrying about that. Since God understands. You know, don't you worry. You keep doing that. Since God knows. He understands. If you don't know who he is, that he is holy, that he is the Lord God, that he loves us, and that he wants us to be holy as he is holy, before you know it, you can believe doctrines of demons. The unbeliever, they're already enslaved. They're under the reign of Satan, sin and death. And Satan's host of wickedness will strive to keep it that way. They will do everything they possibly can to prevent the unbeliever from hearing, from believing and understanding the truth of the gospel. To prevent them coming to Jesus. Maybe there's someone here this morning and you've heard the gospel time and time and time again and still you haven't given your life to the Lord. It's because doctrines of demons have entered your head almost immediately when you walk out that door and they rob you of the truth of the gospel. Maybe there's someone watching in on Facebook or on YouTube and you've heard the gospel time and time and time again. You could probably preach the gospel better than me, but you're still not saved, because doctrines of demons have entered in and have taken away from you the truth of God's word. The demons, the powers of hell, will always be working to keep unbelievers enslaved to sin, sin, and death, to prevent people coming to know Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and for salvation. And let me just make it clear, things are not going to get brighter or better in this world. Rather, the opposite is true. As these last days, and we're definitely living in the last days, as these last days draw to a close, and the return of Jesus is near, things are going to get much worse. And you need to know what you believe, and then whom you have believed. Things are going to get much darker, and even more Dangerous. In these last days, we need to be violent Christians. We need to be violent Christians. And that doesn't mean run out the sex and bait people and pepper up on people's houses and all of this stuff. The word violent here is the word uncompromising. We need to be those people who are uncompromising in our pursuit of the Lord. That we're not going to allow the doctrines of demons to lead us astray or to deflect us from our pursuit of the Lord. We need to be a people who are uncompromisingly pressing ourselves 
into Jesus. Or as I said before, we need to be, uh, like that mural says, it's almost the opposite. We need to be prepared for war, but ready for peace. We need to be prepared for war, ready for peace as we await the return of the Prince of Peace. And so anyway, we've been looking at uh, uh, the final doctrine in our statement of faith, which reads, we believe in the priesthood of all believers and the commitment of all saved persons in the church to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age means to live a Christ-like life, to live like Jesus, meaning we live in accordance with his ways and not the ways of the world, but following the standards of Jesus, which therefore should reflect our relationship with him. <laughs> However, you've been delighted to know, as I said, that no Christian can live like this by their own strength or self-effort. And every one of us who are born again Christians will have tried many times and failed miserably. No Christian can live this Christ-like life by their own strength or by self-effort. We must rely upon the Holy Spirit who is our teacher, our educator, to train us up to live in this way. It's his job. It is the work of the Holy Spirit who educates the whole person, starting from the soul, to enable, equip, and empower us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present day age. He works, as I said over the past number of weeks, he works not to take us out of the world, but to take the world out of us. And what's required of us is that we would have teachable hearts, a willingness to learn from him. We must be willing to submit to the teaching of the Holy Spirit. So turn please to Matthew 25. Keep your finger in Matthew chapter 25. Everybody I'm sure by now knows or has heard the, uh, of the program BGT, Britain's Got Talent. Well, this morning I'm calling this talk EGT. Everyone's got talent. Now, I don't want anybody to come up with up here and say, well, I'll just do a wee solo song. And that will be a nightmare. Uh, nothing like that, but everyone's got talent. Matthew chapter 25, and we're reading verse 14 through to 30. Jesus is speaking and says this. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who has called, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Pardon me. So he, so he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. And his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He also who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more, for to everyone who has more will be given, and he he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, 
even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable, unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping <coughs> and gnashing of teeth. Now I said last week that there are some Bible passages which tend to freak Christians out. I long for those passages because they're there to actually inspire you to study it and try to find out what is this passage actually saying. And so, yes, there are Bible passages that freak us out, and this one is another one. It either freaks people out or it greatly offends them. That a servant of the Lord could be cast into outer darkness. But the second Timothy 3 verse 16, 17 says, All scripture, even the bits that we don't like, even the bits that we don't understand, even the parts where it feels like we're walking through wet blankets or when we're reading it, it feels like drudgery, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man or the woman of God may be complete. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. And although God's work, God's word does all of these things, it also freaks people out or offends people. I would have loved for Paul to break out. It's all scripture does this and it freaks people out and it offends people. So, while sitting on the Mount of Olives with this beautiful panoramic view of Jerusalem before him, Jesus spoke this, what became known as the parable of the talents, to his disciples. He's speaking to his disciples. And I wonder when they heard what Jesus said. I wonder were any of them freaked out. Uh, were any of them offended? Maybe Judas because he was a thief and was always stealing money from the person. Was he offended or was he freaked out? At what Jesus said, you know, the unprofitable servant will be cast into outer darkness. Well, traditionally, the parable is viewed as this nice encouragement to Christians to use their God-given talents or their gifts in service to the Lord and, and for his kingdom. And so this morning it's true to say that you've got talent. You've got talent. God gives all people talents. And the parable demonstrates that the Lord doesn't give everyone the same gifts or the same talents. And yet, whatever talent he has given you, he expects us to use them wisely or to invest our talents or our gifts for his glory. So, you know, you may not be called to be an international preacher. You may not be called with an international healing ministry. But whatever gifts, whatever talent, this is what this seems to suggest. Whatever gifts or talent you have been given... God expects you to use those gifts, those talents, wisely and for his glory. And the implication is that if we use our talents and invest them wisely, then we will be among the faithful servants of the Lord. While on the other hand, it seems to imply if we don't use our talents wisely, if we don't invest them wisely, then we will be cast into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In fact, there's another parable where Jesus talks about and it's like somebody gets a punishment beating at the end for not fulfilling their, 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 their purpose and for not using their talents wisely. So let me ask you this morning, Christian, how's your talent use going? Are you using your talents wisely? Are you investing them wisely? Or have you misunderstood what the message that Jesus is trying to say? Of course, everything that we receive from the Lord should be used for the glory of God. Because everything that we have is given by God. And we should be yielding it to Him. But rather than get freaked out, because this is what I would do when a verse freaks me out, and I did with my early Christian life, I was freaked out constantly. I started to think it was schizophrenic. One week I was a Christian, and the next week I'm not sure I was, and it was all over the place, and my mind was everywhere because of freaky verses. But rather than get freaked out now over any of these types of verses, or rather than get offended by this parable, I see 
I see it as a message from Jesus who loves us. I see it as a message from Jesus to all of mankind that the Lord has given us life. That is fundamentally it. You know, as the Westminster Confession of Faith says, what is man's chief end? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. What is man's purpose? He has given us life and we are to use that life to glorify God. So rather than allow this passage to freak me out or to offend me, I see it, you may see it differently and that's up to you. I see it as a message from Jesus who loves us saying that he has given us life and we ought to live it wisely. We ought to invest it and not waste it. Your life is your talent. The gifts, that's what the Holy Spirit gives you. That's between you and him. But your life is your talent and you've got to use it wisely. See, living godly in this present age, as the doctor says, living soberly, righteously and godly in this present age, under the instruction of the Holy Spirit, that is to use our talents wisely. To live godly means to live with reverence for God. It means to live a well-directed, dutifully devoted life to God. Now let me ask you, Christian, are you using your talent? Are you using what God has given you? Why is it here and again? Living godly in this present age under the instruction of the Holy Spirit is to use our talents wisely. To live godly means living with reverence for God. To live a well-directed, dutifully devoted life to God. Are you devoted to Jesus? It means to be a good and faithful servant. One who is trustworthy, convinced by God's promises, and therefore lives in obedience to his will. To live godly means... To offer genuine, trustworthy, and pure worth, worship unto the Lord. Because that's where worship originally comes from. It is to offer, please hear this, to offer the Lord genuine, trustworthy, pure worship. That is true worship. In fact, do you remember the lady who went with the tub of spikenard? And she broke it open and she anointed the Lord and the beautiful smell filled the entire room and Judas kicked off because he says that could have been sold and the money given to the poor. In other words, that money could have been put in here so that I could have been pocketing it. Uh, but it was called Spikenard. It was a very, very costly ointment and it would have cost a year's salary in those days. And the only way that you can translate Spikenard into English is using these three words. Genuine, trustworthy, and pure or unadulterated. That is the worship that God expects from those who own Him as their Lord and Savior. Well, the opposite of this is to live an ungodly life, to live in an ungodly way. And that simply means that there is no reverence of God, there is no fear of God. Of him. There is no respect for his word or his ways. There is a complete rejection of him and a rebellion against him, living our way, investing our lives in all the wrong things. Remember, I spoke recently and said about the angels speaking to the women at the tomb. Why do you seek the living among the dead? And when you apply that today, what they're saying is, is, why are you looking for life in dead places? And those who invest their talents wrongly are those who are looking for life in dead places. They are living with no reverence for God. They, they have no, they're not convinced of the promises of God. Uh, they have no fear of him. They have no respect for his word or his ways. They have a complete rejection of him and a rebellion against him. And they can be sitting in the church while they have all of these things. They're living their own way, investing their life in all the wrong things. Is it any wonder 
When you hear that, is it any wonder that King David said in Psalm 9 verse 17, the wicked, the ungodly, shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to train, to train us up. And that's us meaning all who call upon the name of Jesus for salvation. It is his work to enable, equip, and empower us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And listen, this has to be made very, very clear this morning because I hear a lot of nonsense about second chances. Let me be clear about this, and I know there will be churches not too far from here who take offense when they read this. But by the way, I've got to say, I, just, I got a phone call during the week. Uh, this guy, elder somebody or and I said, well, can I help you? He says, oh yeah, he says, um, are you a pastor of the church? I said, well, you could say that. <laughs> um, and he says, um, I was just wondering if there's any chance, you know, maybe I could speak in your church. I said, is this a mind up? And he went, no. He says, you know, I'm just looking for training opportunities. I says, how about read your Bible? I said, there's training. I said, you're not be speaking to share. I said, we don't agree with your church. It's a false Jesus that you're telling people. You're leading people into an eternity without Christ because you're telling them all of this nonsense that your church believes. The best training you can do is read your Bible and stop listening to the idiots who are above you telling you what to think. He says, so no, you're not be speaking to share. Anyway, this is why I'm saying this is wrong. If a person does not, in this present age, please listen to this. If a person does not, in this present age, in the time that you have life on this earth, if they do not confess their sin, agree with God who says they're a sinner, if they do not agree with God that they are a sinner, if they don't turn around from their sin and put their trust in Jesus, if they don't believe in Jesus and in Jesus alone for salvation, yielding to the Holy Spirit to begin his work in them, well, let me tell you now and make it absolutely clear, there is no other age whereby you can be made holy or wherein you can be made holy. There is no other age. There is no afterlife will make you holy. There is no Jewish Gehenna for those Jews who believe that in Gehenna there's an opportunity for sins to be burned up. There is no Islamic Barzak. There is no Buddhist Bardo. There is no Hindu Naraka. There is no Roman Catholic Purgatory. There is no Mormon Spirit Prison. There is nowhere outside this present age where a person can be made godly through faith in Jesus Christ. And if it doesn't happen in this life, if you are not made godly in this present age, it will never happen. You will be an unfaithful servant who has wasted their talents, their God-given gifts, who has wasted their life, and you shall, according to the word of God, be turned into hell, cast into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is what the word of God says. That is why that man won't be speaking in this church. Because on that point, they believe that you get a second chance. That you can live your life in whatever way you want. I, I, I thought it was true. I'd be in that church next week. Live your life whatever way you want. And it'll be okay because you're going just to spur prison. Pardon me. I've been in the prison. I think I could manage it for a short time. So I was I know that eventually I'm getting up to heaven. But it's a lie, it is not in the Bible. Muslims, they believe that they can kill Jews and they can blow themselves up and murder as many infidels as they like. And not only will there be these festal virgins waiting on them when they get out of Barzak, but they think that this Barzak will be a wonderful place. The Hindus, they, they have their Naraka. The Buddhists, they're born. They all desperately grasp for something after life. They have to say to themselves that the reality is that what they believe isn't satisfying the deepest need in their souls. That they're so scared when it comes to death that they have to create another line to say there'll be a nice wee place after death where even if you haven't had your sins forgiven straight away, will there be an opportunity? Even 
the lie of purgatory. And no disrespect, I believe that there are many born again Catholic people, but the lie of purgatory was made up. There is no such place. You will not die and go to purgatory, and if there was a priest or a nun in your house, that the Virgin Mary herself will come out of heaven and lift you out of there. There's no such place. You have to be made godly in this present age. After that, there is no more chance. There is no hope. If it doesn't happen, if you are not made godly in this present age, it will never happen. And you will be an unfaithful servant who wasted their talents, wasted your life. And the Bible says, not Tally Gordon, you will be turned into hell. You will be cast into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But that was never what God planned. That was never what God wanted. God loves us. And he came to save us so that we would not ever end up there. Christian, you've got talent. But how's your talent use going? Are you using it and investing it wisely? The Lord has given you a new life. You have been born again by the Spirit of God. And you ought to live and invest your new life wisely and not waste it. And may your teacher, your educator, the Holy Spirit, train you up to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age to the glory of God your Father, who is worthy of your true worth. Ship, your true worship. The Lord wants speck in our worship from you. He wants your worship of Him to be genuine, trustworthy, and pure worship. Is that Christian what you're offering the Lord this morning? Maybe there's someone here and you're not yet a Christian. Well, let me just say to you, maybe somebody watching on Facebook or on YouTube, but let me just say to you, you've got talent too. The Lord has given you life, but are you using it and investing it wisely? Because of sin, because of rebellion against God, the only way that you can use your talent, that you can use life wisely, is to give it back to the Lord and let Him, by His Holy Spirit, cause you to be born again and train you up to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Failure to do so is to continue to live in an ungodly way. Listen, you could be very religious. You could be a very, very nice person. You could be very, uh, a very good person doing wonderful, good works. Right over all over this world, you could be doing incredible things. But if you're not born again, you're living in an ungodly way. You have no reverence of God. You have no fear of him. You do not respect his word or his ways. You are rejecting him and rebelling against him. You are living your life your way, investing it in all the wrong things. And if you persist in your ways, then you will be among the wicked, the ungodly, who shall be turned into hell. But that is not what God wants for you. He is offering you salvation this morning. If you will confess your sin, agree with him that you're a sinner. Repent, turn around, turn away from your sin. And put your trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone for salvation. If you do that this morning, you shall be saved. And you shall be among those who will be declared the faithful servants of the Lord. Lord, this morning we want to thank you that as we bring this series to a close after all of these years, we want to thank you, Lord, that we are reminded this morning that we live in dark and dangerous times. And that as Christians, Lord, we need to be a people who know what we believe and know in whom we have belief. And we ask, Lord, please, that you would help us to know you and love you, to offer you true worship, Lord. To give you, Lord, that spike in our worship that's genuine, that's trustworthy, that's pure. Lord, and where there would be any impurities in what we offer you, we pray that the Spirit of God, our teacher, 
would deal with those issues in our lives so that they would be removed and we would be offering you spanking our worship at all times. Train us up, Holy Spirit, please, in this present age to live soberly, righteously and godly to the glory of our God and Father, please. And Lord, I pray for anyone who's not yet a Christian that you would help them to see that it doesn't matter how nice they are, it doesn't matter how much they can rhyme off Bible verses and sing hymns and raise up their hands and worship or whatever, if they're not born again, if they're not, Lord, in this present age, surrendering their lives to Christ, there is no other age when they can be made godly. Father, please speak today of your love for them. Speak it into their lives and help them to repent, please, and put their trust in Jesus Christ, your Son. Thank you.